In astronomy, axial precession is a gravity-induced, slow, and continuous change in the orientation of an astronomical body's rotational axis. In particular, it can refer to the gradual shift in the orientation of Earth's axis of rotation in a cycle of approximately 25,772 years. This is similar to the precession of a spinning top, with the axis tracing out a pair of cones joined at their apices. The term, precession, typically refers only to this largest part of the motion. Other changes in the alignment of Earth's axis mutation and polar motion are much smaller in magnitude. Earth's precession was historically called the precession of the equinoxes, because the equinoxes moved westward along the ecliptic relative to the fixed stars, opposite to the yearly motion of the Sun along the ecliptic. This term is still used in non-technical discussions, that is, when detailed mathematics are absent. Historically, the discovery of the precession of the equinoxes is usually attributed in the West to the Hellenistic era (2nd century BC) astronomer Hipparchus, although there are claims of its earlier discovery, such as in the Indian text Vedanga Jyotisha, dating from 700 BC. With improvements in the ability to calculate the gravitational force between planets during the first half of the 19th century, it was recognized that the ecliptic itself moved slightly, which was named planetary precession, as early as 1863, while the dominant component was named lunisolar precession. Their combination was named general precession, instead of precession of the equinoxes. Lunisolar precession is caused by the gravitational forces of the Moon and Sun on Earth's equatorial bulge, causing Earth's axis to move with respect to inertial space. Planetary precession an advance, is due to the small angle between the gravitational force of the other planets on Earth and its orbital plane the ecliptic, causing the plane of the ecliptic to shift slightly relative to inertial space. Lunisolar precession is about 500 times greater than planetary precession. In addition to the Moon and Sun, the other planets also cause a small movement of Earth's axis in inertial space, making the contrast in the terms lunisolar versus planetary misleading. So in 2006, the International Astronomical Union recommended that the dominant component be renamed the precession of the equator and the minor component be renamed precession of the ecliptic, but their combination is still named general precession. Many references to the old terms exist in publications predating the change. Nomenclature Etymologically, precession and precession are both terms that relate to motion. Precession is derived from the Latin praesidia, to proceed, to come before or earlier, while precession is derived from the Latin procedere, to march forward, to advance. Generally the term precession is used to describe a group of objects moving forward. The stars viewed from Earth are seen to proceed in a precession from east to west daily, due to the Earth's diurnal motion, and yearly, due to the Earth's revolution around the Sun. At the same time the stars can be observed to anticipate slightly such motion, at the rate of approximately 50 arc seconds per year, a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. In describing this motion astronomers generally have shortened the term to simply precession. In describing the cause of the motion physicists have also used the term precession, which has led to some confusion between the observable phenomenon and its cause, which matters because in astronomy, some precessions are real and others are apparent. 
This issue is further obfuscated by the fact that many astronomers are physicists or astrophysicists. It should be noted that the term, precession used in astronomy generally describes the observable precession of the equinox the stars moving retrograde across the sky, whereas the term, precession, as used in physics, generally describes a mechanical process. Effects <laughs> 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 The precession of the Earth's axis has a number of observable effects. First, the positions of the south and north celestial poles appear to move in circles against the space-fixed backdrop of stars, completing one circuit in approximately 26,000 years. Thus, while today the star Polaris lies approximately at the north celestial pole, this will change over time, and other stars will become the North Star. In approximately 3,200 years, the star Gamma Cephei in the Cepheus constellation will succeed Polaris for this position. The South Celestial Pole currently lacks a bright star to mark its position, but over time precession also will cause bright stars to become South Stars. As the celestial poles shift, there is a corresponding gradual shift in the apparent orientation of the whole star field, as viewed from a particular position on Earth. Secondly, the position of the Earth in its orbit around the Sun at the solstices, equinoxes, or other time defined relative to the seasons, slowly changes. For example, suppose that the Earth's orbital position is marked at the summer solstice, when the Earth's axial tilt is pointing directly toward the Sun. One full orbit later, when the Sun has returned to the same apparent position relative to the background stars, the Earth's axial tilt is not now directly toward the Sun, because of the effects of precession, it is a little way beyond this. In other words, the solstice occurred a little earlier in the orbit. Thus, the tropical year, measuring the cycle of seasons for example, the time from solstice to solstice, or equinox to equinox, is about 20 minutes shorter than the sidereal year, which is measured by the Sun's apparent position relative to the stars. After about 26,000 years the difference amounts to a full year, so the positions of the seasons relative to the orbit are «back where they started». Other effects also slowly change the shape and orientation of the Earth's orbit, and these, in combination with precession, create various cycles of differing periods, see also Milankovitch cycles. The magnitude of the Earth's tilt, as opposed to merely its orientation, also changes slowly over time, but this effect is not attributed directly to precession. For identical reasons, the apparent position of the Sun relative to the backdrop of the stars at some seasonally fixed time slowly regresses a full 360 degrees through all twelve traditional constellations of the zodiac, at the rate of about 50.3 seconds of arc per year, or one degree every 71.6 years. At present, the rate of precession corresponds to a period of 25,772 years, but the rate itself varies somewhat with time see values below, so one cannot say that in exactly 25,772 years the Earth's axis will be back to where it is now. For further details, see changing pole stars and polar shift and equinoxes shift, below. Topic History Topic Hellenistic World Topic Hipparchus the discovery of precession usually is attributed to Hipparchus 190 to 120 BC of Rhodes or Nicaea, a Greek astronomer. 
According to Ptolemy's Almagest, Hipparchus measured the longitude of Spica and other bright stars. Comparing his measurements with data from his predecessors, Timacharis and Aristilus BC, he concluded that Spica had moved two degrees relative to the autumnal equinox. He also compared the lengths of the tropical year the time it takes the sun to return to an equinox and the sidereal year the time it takes the sun to return to a fixed star, and found a slight discrepancy. Hipparchus concluded that the equinoxes were moving, processing, through the zodiac, and that the rate of precession was not less than one degree in a century, in other words, completing a full cycle in no more than 36,000 years. Virtually all of the writings of Hipparchus are lost, including his work on precession. They are mentioned by Ptolemy, who explains precession as the rotation of the celestial sphere around a motionless Earth. It is reasonable to presume that Hipparchus, similarly to Ptolemy, thought of precession in geocentric terms as a motion of the heavens, rather than of the earth. Topic: <laughs> Ptolemy The first astronomer known to have continued Hipparchus's work on precession is Ptolemy in the 2nd century AD. Ptolemy measured the longitudes of Regulus, Spica, and other bright stars with a variation of Hipparchus's lunar method that did not require eclipses. Before sunset, he measured the longitudinal arc separating the Moon from the Sun. Then, after sunset, he measured the arc from the Moon to the star. He used Hipparchus's model to calculate the Sun's longitude, and made corrections for the Moon's motion and its parallax Evans 1998, pp. 251–255. Ptolemy compared his own observations with those made by Hipparchus, Menelaus of Alexandria, Timacharis, and Agrippa. He found that between Hipparchus's time and his own about 265 years, the stars had moved 2 degrees 40, or 1 degree in 100 years 36. Per year, the rate accepted today is about 50 inches per year or 1 degree in 72 years. He also confirmed that precession affected all fixed stars, not just those near the ecliptic, and his cycle had the same period of 36,000 years as found by Hipparchus. <laughs> Other authors Most ancient authors did not mention precession and, perhaps, did not know of it. For instance, Proclus rejected precession, while Theon of Alexandria, a commentator on Ptolemy in the 4th century, accepted Ptolemy's explanation. Theon also reports an alternate theory. According to certain opinions ancient astrologers believed that from a certain epoch the solstitial signs have a motion of 8 degrees in the order of the signs, after which they go back the same amount. Dreyer 1958, p. 204 Instead of proceeding through the entire sequence of the zodiac, the equinoxes «trepidated» back and forth over an arc of 8 degrees. The theory of trepidation is presented by Theon as an alternative to precession. <laughs> alternative discovery theories Babylonians Various assertions have been made that other cultures discovered precession independently of Hipparchus. According to Al-Batani, the Chaldean astronomers had distinguished the tropical and sidereal year so that by approximately 330 BC, they would have been in a position to describe precession, if inaccurately, but such claims generally are regarded as unsupported. 
Topic: <laughs> Maya. The archaeologist Susan Milbrath has speculated that the Mesoamerican long count calendar of 30,000 years involving the Pleiades Dot may have been an effort to calculate the precession of the equinox. This view is held by few other professional scholars of Mayan civilization. Topic: <laughs> Ancient Egyptians. Similar claims have been made that precession was known in ancient Egypt during the dynastic era, prior to the time of Hipparchus Ptolemaic period. However, these claims remain controversial. Some buildings in the Karnak Temple complex, for instance, allegedly were oriented toward the point on the horizon where certain stars rose or set at key times of the year. Nonetheless, they kept accurate calendars and if they recorded the date of the temple reconstructions it would be a fairly simple matter to plot the rough precession rate. The Dendera Zodiac, a star map from the Hathor Temple at Dendera from a late Ptolemaic age, allegedly records precession of the equinoxes Tompkins, 1971. In any case, if the ancient Egyptians knew of precession, their knowledge is not recorded as such in any of their surviving astronomical texts. Michael Rice wrote in his Egypt's Legacy, "...whether or not the ancients knew of the mechanics of the precession before its definition by Hipparchos the Bithynian in the 2nd century BC is uncertain, but as dedicated watchers of the night sky they could not fail to be aware of its effects." p. 128 Rice believes that the procession is fundamental to an understanding of what powered the development of Egypt." p. 10, to the extent that, in a sense Egypt as a nation-state and the king of Egypt as a living god are the products of the realization by the Egyptians of the astronomical changes affected by the immense apparent movement of the heavenly bodies which the procession implies. P. 56. Rice says that, "...the evidence that the most refined astronomical observation was practiced in Egypt in the 3rd millennium BC and probably even before that date is clear from the precision with which the pyramids at Giza are aligned to the cardinal points, a precision which could only have been achieved by their alignment with the stars." P. 31. The Egyptians also, says Rice, were to alter the orientation of a temple when the star on whose position it had originally been set moved its position as a consequence of the procession, something which seems to have happened several times during the New Kingdom. p. 170. Topic. Indian views Indian astrologers were aware of axial precession since before the Common Era. Although many of the astronomical texts stored in Taxila were burnt during Muslim invasion of India, the classic astronomical text Surya Siddhanta survived and contains references about Ayana movements. In a later commentary on Surya Siddhanta around 12th century, Bhaskara II says, "...Sampat revolves negatively 30,000 times in a kalpa of 4,320 million years according to Surya Siddhanta, while Munjala and others say Ayana moves forward 199,669 in a kalpa, and one should combine the two." before ascertaining declension, ascensional difference, etc." Lancelot Wilkinson translated the last of these three verses in a too concise manner to convey the full meaning, and skipped the portion combine the two which the modern Hindu commentary has brought to the fore. 
According to the Hindu commentary, the final value of period of precession should be obtained by combining plus 199669 revolutions of Ayana with minus 30,000 revolutions of Sampart, to get plus 169669 revolutions per Kalpa, i.e. one revolution in 25461 years, which is near the modern value of 25,771 years. Moreover, Manjala's value gives a period of 21,636 years for Ayana's motion, which is the modern value of precession when anomalistic precession also is taken into account. The latter has a period of 136,000 years now, but Bhaskatu gives its value at 144,000 years 30,000 in a kalpa, calling it Sampat. Bhaskatu did not give any name of the final term after combining the negative Sampat with the positive Ayana. The value he gave indicates, however, that by Ayana he meant precession on account of the combined influence of orbital and anomalistic precessions, and by Sampat he meant the anomalistic period, but defined it as equinox. His language is a bit confused, which he clarified in his own Vasanabhashya commentary Siddhanta Shiromani, by saying that Surya Siddhanta was not available and he was writing on the basis of hearsay. Bhaskar II did not give his own opinion, he merely cited Surya Siddhanta, Manjala, and unnamed others. Extant Surya Siddhanta supports the notion of trepidation within a range of plus or minus 27 degrees at the rate of 54 per year according to traditional commentators, but Burgess opined that the original meaning must have been of a cyclical motion, for which he quoted the Surya Siddhanta mentioned by Bhaskar II. Chinese astronomy Yu Shi 4th century AD was the first Chinese astronomer to mention precession. He estimated the rate of precession as 1 degree in 50 years Panikuk 1961, p. 92. <inaudible> <inaudible> Middle Ages and Renaissance In medieval Islamic astronomy, precession was known based on Ptolemy's Almagest, and by observations that refined the value. al batani in his Zij al-Sabi, after mentioning Hipparchus calculating precession, and Ptolemy's value of 1 degree per 100 solar years, says that he measured precession and found it to be 1 degree per 66 solar years. Subsequently, al Sufi mentions the same values in his Book of Fixed Stars that Ptolemy's value for precession is 1 degree per 100 solar years. He then quotes a different value from Zij al Mumtahan, which was done during al Mamun's reign, as 1 degree for every 66 solar years. He also quotes the aforementioned al Batani's Zij al Sabi as adjusting coordinates for stars by 11 degrees and 10 minutes of arc to account for the difference between al Batani's time and Ptolemy's. Later, the Zij i Ilkhani compiled at the Maraha Observatory sets the precession of the equinoxes at 51 arc seconds per annum, which is very close to the modern value of 50.2 arc seconds. In the Middle Ages, Islamic and Latin Christian astronomers treated trepidation as a motion of the fixed stars to be added to precession. This theory is commonly attributed to the Arab astronomer Thabit ibn Qurra, but the attribution has been contested in modern times. Nicolaus Copernicus published a different account of trepidation in De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium. This work makes the first definite reference to precession as the result of a motion of the Earth's axis. Copernicus characterized precession as the third motion of the Earth. Topic: 
Modern period Over a century later precession was explained in Isaac Newton's Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica 1687, to be a consequence of gravitation Evans 1998, p. 246. Newton's original precession equations did not work, however, and were revised considerably by Jean La Ronde d'Alembert and subsequent scientists. Hipparchus's discovery Hipparchus gave an account of his discovery in On the Displacement of the Solstitial and Equinoctial Points described in Almagest 3.1 and 7.2. He measured the ecliptic longitude of the star speaker during lunar eclipses and found that it was about 6 degrees west of the autumnal equinox. By comparing his own measurements with those of Timocharis of Alexandria, a contemporary of Euclid, who worked with Aristilus early in the 3rd century BC, he found that Spica's longitude had decreased by about 2 degrees in the meantime exact years are not mentioned in Almagest. Also in 7.2, Ptolemy gives more precise observations of two stars, including Spica and concludes that in each case a 2 degrees, 40 change occurred during 128 BC and AD 139 hence, 1 degree per century or one full cycle in 36000 years, that is, the precessional period of Hipparchus as reported by Ptolemy, cf. page 328 in Tumor translation of Almagest, 1998 edition. He also noticed this motion in other stars. He speculated that only the stars near the zodiac shifted over time. Ptolemy called this his first hypothesis, Almagest 7.1, but did not report any later hypothesis Hipparchus might have devised. Hipparchus apparently limited his speculations, because he had only a few older observations, which were not very reliable. Why did Hipparchus need a lunar eclipse to measure the position of a star? The equinoctial points are not marked in the sky, so he needed the Moon as a reference point. Hipparchus already had developed a way to calculate the longitude of the Sun at any moment. A lunar eclipse happens during full moon, when the moon is in opposition. At the midpoint of the eclipse, the moon is precisely 180 degrees from the Sun. Hipparchus is thought to have measured the longitudinal arc separating Spica from the moon. To this value, he added the calculated longitude of the Sun, plus 180 degrees for the longitude of the moon. He did the same procedure with Timachara's data Evans 1998, p. 251. Observations such as these eclipses, incidentally, are the main source of data about when Hipparchus worked, since other biographical information about him is minimal. The lunar eclipses he observed, for instance, took place on April 21, 146 BC, and March 21, 135 BC Tuma 1984, p. 135 n. 14. Hipparchus also studied precession in on the length of the year. Two kinds of year are relevant to understanding his work. The tropical year is the length of time that the Sun, as viewed from the Earth, takes to return to the same position along the ecliptic its path among the stars on the celestial sphere. The sidereal year is the length of time that the Sun takes to return to the same position with respect to the stars of the celestial sphere. Precession causes the stars to change their longitude slightly each year, so the sidereal year is longer than the tropical year. 
Using observations of the equinoxes and solstices, Hipparchus found that the length of the tropical year was 365 plus 1 quarter minus 1 300 days, or 365.24667 days Evans 1998, p. 209. Comparing this with the length of the sidereal year, he calculated that the rate of precession was not less than one degree in a century. From this information, it is possible to calculate that his value for the sidereal year was 365 plus 1 quarter plus 1 144 days Tuma 1978, p. 218. By giving a minimum rate he may have been allowing for errors in observation. To approximate his tropical year Hipparchus created his own lunisolar calendar by modifying those of Meton and Callippus in on intercalary months and days now lost, as described by Ptolemy in the Almagest 3.1 the Babylonian calendar used a cycle of 235 lunar months in 19 years since 499 BC with only three exceptions before 380 BC, but it did not use a specified number of days. The Metonic cycle 432 BC assigned 6,940 days to these 19 years producing an average year of 365 plus 1 quarter plus 176 or 365.26316 days. The Calypic cycle 330 BC dropped one day from four metonic cycles 76 years for an average year of 365 plus 1 quarter or 365.25 days. Hipparchus dropped one more day from four Calypic cycles 304 years, creating the Hippocic cycle with an average year of 365 plus 1 quarter minus 1 304 or 365.24671 days, which was close to his tropical year of 365 plus 1 quarter minus 1 300 or 365.2 24667 days We find Hipparchus's mathematical signatures in the Antikythera mechanism an ancient astronomical computer of the 2nd century BC The mechanism is based on a solar year the metonic cycle which is the period the moon reappears in the same place in the sky with the same phase full moon appears at the same position in the sky approximately in 19 years, the Calypic cycle which is four metonic cycles and more accurate, the Seiros cycle and the Exolimos cycles three Seiros cycles for the accurate eclipse prediction. The study of the Antikythera mechanism proves that the ancients have been using very accurate calendars based on all the aspects of solar and lunar motion in the sky. In fact, the lunar mechanism which is part of the Antikythera mechanism depicts the motion of the Moon and its phase, for a given time, using a train of four gears with a pin and slot device which gives a variable lunar velocity that is very close to the second law of Kepler i.e., takes into account the fast motion of the Moon at perigee and slow motion at apogee. This discovery proves that Hipparchus' mathematics were much more advanced than Ptolemy describes in his books, as it is evident that he developed a good approximation of Kepler's second law. <laughs> Mithraic question The Mithraic Mysteries, colloquially also known as Mithraism, was a 1st–4th century Neo-Platonic mystery cult of the Roman god Mithras. The near total lack of written descriptions or scripture necessitates a reconstruction of beliefs and practices from the archaeological evidence, such as that found in Mithraic temples in modern times called Mithraia, which were real or artificial caves 
representing the cosmos. Until the 1970s most scholars followed Franz Cumont in identifying Mithras as a continuation of the Persian god Mithra. Cumont's continuity hypothesis, and his concomitant theory that the astrological component was a late and unimportant accretion, is no longer followed. Today, the cult and its beliefs are recognized as a product of Greco-Roman thought, with an astrological component even more heavily pronounced than the already very astrology-centric Roman beliefs generally were. The details, however, are debated. As far as axial precession is concerned, one scholar of Mithraism, David Yolanzi, has interpreted Mithras as a personification of the force responsible for precession Yolanzi, 1989. He argues that the cult was a religious response to Hipparchus's discovery of precession, which, from the ancient geocentric perspective, amounted to the discovery that the entire cosmos i.e., the outermost celestial sphere of the fixed stars was moving in a previously unknown way. His analysis is based on the so-called tauroctony, the image of Mithras killing a bull that was located in the central place in every Mithraic temple. In the standard tauroctony, Mithras and the bull are accompanied by a dog, a snake, a raven, and a scorpion. According to Yolanzi, the tauroctony is a star chart. The bull is Taurus, a constellation of the zodiac. In the astrological age that preceded the time of Hipparchus, the vernal equinox had taken place when the Sun was in the constellation of Taurus, and during that previous epoch the constellations of Canis Minor the dog, Hydra the snake, Corvus the raven, and Scorpius the scorpion, i.e., the constellations that correspond to the animals depicted in the Tauroctony, all lay on the celestial equator the location of which is shifted by the precession and thus had privileged positions in the sky during that epoch. Mithras himself represents the constellation Perseus, which is located directly above Taurus the bull, the same location occupied by Mithras in the Tauroctony image. Mithras' killing of the bull, by this reasoning, represented the power possessed by this new god to shift the entire cosmic structure, turning the cosmic sphere so that the location of the spring equinox left the constellation of Taurus a transition symbolized by the killing of the bull, and the dog, snake, raven, and scorpion likewise lost their privileged positions on the celestial equator. The iconography also contains two torch-bearing twins courts and cortopates, framing the bull-slaying image—one holding a torch pointing up and the other a torch pointing down. These torch-bearers are sometimes depicted with one of them torch up, holding or associated with a bull and a tree with leaves, and the other torch down, holding or associated with a scorpion and a tree with fruit. Yolanzi interprets these torch-bearers as representing the spring equinox torch up, tree with leaves, bull and the autumn equinox torch down, tree with fruit, scorpion in Taurus and Scorpius respectively, which is where the equinoxes were located during the preceding «Age of Taurus», symbolized in the Tauroctony as a whole. Thus Yolanzi concludes that Mithraic iconography was an astronomical code, whose secret was the existence of a new cosmic divinity, unknown to those outside the cult, whose fundamental attribute was his ability to shift the structure of the entire cosmos and thereby to control the astrological forces believed at that time to determine human existence, thus giving him the power to grant his devotees success during life and salvation after death i.e., a safe journey through the planetary spheres and a subsequent immortal existence existence in the realm of the stars. Topic. Changing pole stars A consequence of the procession is a changing pole star. 
Currently Polaris is extremely well suited to mark the position of the North Celestial Pole, as Polaris is a moderately bright star with a visual magnitude of 2.1, variable, and it is located about 1 degree from the pole, with no stars of similar brightness too close. The previous pole star was Kochev, Beta Ursae Minoris, Beta Umi, Beta Ursae Minoris, the brightest star in the bowl of the Little Dipper, located 16 degrees from Polaris. It held that role from 1500 BC to AD 500. It was not quite as accurate in its day as Polaris is today. Today, Kochev and its neighbor Firkid are referred to as the Guardians of the Pole, meaning Polaris. On the other hand, Thuban in the constellation Draco, which was the pole star in 3000 BC, is much less conspicuous at magnitude 3.67, one fifth as bright as Polaris. Today it is invisible in light polluted urban skies. The brilliant Vega in the constellation Lyra is often touted as the best North Star. It fulfilled that role around 12,000 BC and will do so again around the year 14,000. However, it never comes closer than 5 degrees to the pole. When Polaris becomes the North Star again around 27,800, due to its proper motion it then will be farther away from the pole than it is now, while in 23,600 BC it came closer to the pole. It is more difficult to find the South Celestial Pole in the sky at this moment, as that area is a particularly bland portion of the sky, and the nominal South Pole star is Sigma Octantis, which with magnitude 5.5 is barely visible to the naked eye even under ideal conditions. That will change from the 80th to the 90th centuries, however, when the South Celestial Pole travels through the False Cross. This situation also is seen on a star map. The orientation of the South Pole is moving toward the Southern Cross constellation. For the last 2,000 years or so, the Southern Cross has pointed to the South Celestial Pole. As a consequence, the constellation is no longer visible from subtropical northern latitudes, as it was in the time of the ancient Greeks. Topic. Polar shift and equinoxes shift The images at right attempt to explain the relation between the precession of the Earth's axis and the shift in the equinoxes. These images show the position of the Earth's axis on the celestial sphere, a fictitious sphere which places the stars according to their position as seen from Earth, regardless of their actual distance. The first image shows the celestial sphere from the outside, with the constellations in mirror image. The second image shows the perspective of a near-Earth position as seen through a very wide-angle lens, from which the apparent distortion arises. The rotation axis of the Earth describes, over a period of 25,700 years, a small circle, blue among the stars, centered on the ecliptic North Pole the blue e, and with an angular radius of about 23.4 degrees, an angle known as the obliquity of the ecliptic. The direction of precession is opposite to the daily rotation of the Earth on its axis. The orange axis was the Earth's rotation axis 5,000 years ago, when it pointed to the star Thuban. The yellow axis, pointing to Polaris, marks the axis now. The equinoxes occur where the celestial equator intersects the ecliptic red line, that is, where the Earth's axis is perpendicular to the line connecting the centers of the Sun and Earth. Note that the term equinox here refers to a point on the celestial sphere so defined, rather than the moment in time when the Sun is overhead at the equator, though the two meanings are related. 
When the axis processes from one orientation to another, the equatorial plane of the Earth, indicated by the circular grid around the equator, moves. The celestial equator is just the Earth's equator projected onto the celestial sphere, so it moves as the Earth's equatorial plane moves, and the intersection with the ecliptic moves with it. The positions of the poles and equator on Earth do not change, only the orientation of the Earth against the fixed stars. As seen from the orange grid, 5,000 years ago, the vernal equinox was close to the star Aldebaran of Taurus. Now, as seen from the yellow grid, it has shifted indicated by the red arrow, to somewhere in the constellation of Pisces. Still pictures like these are only first approximations, as they do not take into account the variable speed of the precession, the variable obliquity of the ecliptic, the planetary precession which is a slow rotation of the ecliptic plane itself, presently around an axis located on the plane, with longitude 174 degrees and the proper motions of the stars. The precessional eras of each constellation, often known as great months, are approximately Cause The precession of the equinoxes is caused by the gravitational forces of the Sun and the Moon, and to a lesser extent other bodies, on the Earth. It was first explained by Sir Isaac Newton. Axial precession is similar to the precession of a spinning top. In both cases, the applied force is due to gravity. For a spinning top, this force tends to be almost parallel to the rotation axis initially and increases as the top slows down. For a gyroscope on a stand, it can approach 90 degrees. For the Earth, however, the applied forces of the Sun and the Moon are closer to perpendicular to the axis of rotation. The Earth is not a perfect sphere but an oblate spheroid, with an equatorial diameter about 43 km larger than its polar diameter. Because of the Earth's axial tilt, during most of the year the half of this bulge that is closest to the Sun is off-center, either to the north or to the south, and the far half is off-center on the opposite side. The gravitational pull on the closer half is stronger, since gravity decreases with the square of distance, so this creates a small torque on the Earth as the Sun pulls harder on one side of the Earth than the other. The axis of this torque is roughly perpendicular to the axis of the Earth's rotation so the axis of rotation processes. If the Earth was a perfect sphere, there would be no precession. This average torque is perpendicular to the direction in which the rotation axis is tilted away from the ecliptic pole, so that it does not change the axial tilt itself. The magnitude of the torque from the Sun or the Moon varies with the angle between the Earth's spin axis direction and that of the gravitational attraction. It approaches zero when they are perpendicular. For example, this happens at the equinoxes in the case of the interaction with the Sun. This can be seen to be since the near and far points are aligned with the gravitational attraction, so there is no torque due to the difference in gravitational attraction. Although the above explanation involved the Sun, the same explanation holds true for any object moving around the Earth, along or close to the ecliptic, notably, the Moon. The combined action of the Sun and the Moon is called the lunisolar precession. In addition to the steady progressive motion resulting in a full circle in about 25,700 years the Sun and Moon also cause small periodic variations, due to their changing positions. These oscillations, in both precessional speed and axial tilt, are known as the nutation. 
the most important term has a period of 18.6 years and an amplitude of 9.2 arcseconds. In addition to lunisolar precession, the actions of the other planets of the Solar System cause the whole ecliptic to rotate slowly around an axis which has an ecliptic longitude of about 174 degrees measured on the instantaneous ecliptic. This so-called planetary precession shift amounts to a rotation of the ecliptic plane of 0.47 seconds of arc per year more than a hundred times smaller than lunisolar precession. The sum of the two precessions is known as the general precession. Equations <inaudible> 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 The tidal force on Earth due to a perturbing body sun, moon or planet, is expressed by Newton's law of universal gravitation, whereby the gravitational force of the perturbing body on the side of Earth nearest is said to be greater than the gravitational force on the far side by an amount proportional to the difference in the cubes of the distances between the near and far sides. If the gravitational force of the perturbing body acting on the mass of the Earth as a point mass at the center of Earth which provides the centripetal force causing the orbital motion is subtracted from the gravitational force of the perturbing body everywhere on the surface of Earth, what remains may be regarded as the tidal force. This gives the paradoxical notion of a force acting away from the satellite but in reality it is simply a lesser force towards that body due to the gradient in the gravitational field. For precession, this tidal force can be grouped into two forces which only act on the equatorial bulge outside of a mean spherical radius. This couple can be decomposed into two pairs of components, one pair parallel to Earth's equatorial plane toward and away from the perturbing body which cancel each other out, and another pair parallel to Earth's rotational axis, both toward the ecliptic plane. The latter pair of forces creates the following torque vector on Earth's equatorial bulge T equals 3 g m r 3 c minus a sin delta cos delta sin alpha minus cos alpha Zero display style overwrite arrow t equals frac three gigameters r carrot three c a sin delta cos delta begin p matrix sin alpha cos alpha zero end p matrix where g m equals standard gravitational parameter of the perturbing body r equals geocentric distance to the perturbing body. C equals moment of inertia around Earth's axis of rotation. A equals moment of inertia around any equatorial diameter of Earth. C minus A equals moment of inertia of Earth's equatorial bulge. C greater than A. Delta equals declination of the perturbing body north or south of equator. Alpha equals right ascension of the perturbing body east from vernal equinox. The three unit vectors of the torque at the center of the Earth, top to bottom, are x on a line within the ecliptic plane, the intersection of Earth's equatorial plane with the ecliptic plane, directed toward the vernal equinox, y on a line in the ecliptic plane, directed toward the summer solstice, 90 degrees east of x, and z on a line directed toward the north. Pole of the ecliptic. 
The value of the three sinusoidal terms in the direction of x sin delta cos delta sin alpha for the sun is a sine squared waveform varying from zero at the equinoxes 0 degrees, 180 degrees to 0 0.36495 at the solstices 90 degrees, 270 degrees. The value in the direction of y sin delta cos delta minus cos alpha for the sun is a sine wave varying from zero at the four equinoxes and solstices to plus or minus 0 0.19364, slightly more than half of the sine squared peak, halfway between each equinox and solstice, with peaks slightly skewed toward the equinoxes, 43.37 degrees minus 130. 36.63 degrees plus 223.37 degrees minus 316.63 degrees plus both solar waveforms have about the same peak-to-peak -peak amplitude and the same period half of a revolution or half of a year the value in the direction of z is zero the average torque of the sine wave in the direction of y is zero for the sun or moon, so this component of the torque does not affect precession. The average torque of the sine squared waveform in the direction of x for the sun or moon is T x equals 3 2 g m a three one minus E two three two C minus a sin E cos E display style t underscore x equals frac three two frac gm a carrot three one e carrot two carrot three halves c a sin epsilon cos epsilon where a display style r topic semimior axis of Earth's suns orbit or moons orbit e Eccentricity of Earth's suns orbit or moons orbit and one half accounts for the average of the sine squared waveform. A three one minus e two three two display style a carrot three one e carrot two carrot three halves accounts for the average distance cubed of the Sun or Moon from Earth over the entire elliptical orbit, and e display style epsilon the angle between the equatorial plane and the ecliptic plane is the maximum value of delta for the Sun and the average maximum value for the Moon over an entire 18.6-year cycle. Precession is d Psi d t equals t x c omega sin e display style frac d psi d t equals frac t underscore x c omega sin epsilon where omega is Earth's angular velocity and c omega is Earth's angular momentum. Thus the first order component of precession due to the Sun is d psi s d t equals 3 2 g m a Three one minus E two three two S 
C minus A C cos E omega E Display style frac D psi underscore S D T equals frac three two left frac GM a carrot three one E carrot two carrot three halves right underscore S left frac C A C frac cos epsilon omega right underscore E Whereas that due to the moon is D psi L D T equals three two G M one minus one point five sin two I A three one minus E two three two L C minus A C cos E omega E Display style frac D psi underscore L D T equals frac three two left frac GM one to one five sin carrot two I A carrot three one E carrot two carrot three halves right underscore L left frac C A C frac cos epsilon omega right underscore E where A is the angle between the plane of the Moon's orbit and the ecliptic plane. In these two equations, the Sun's parameters are within square brackets labeled S, the Moon's parameters are within square brackets labeled L, and the Earth's parameters are within square brackets labeled E. The term 1 minus 1.5 sin Two I display style one to one point five sin carrot two I accounts for the inclination of the moon's orbit relative to the ecliptic. The term c minus a c is Earth's dynamical ellipticity or flattening, which is adjusted to the observed precession because Earth's internal structure is not known with sufficient detail. If Earth were homogeneous, the term would equal its third eccentricity squared. E two equals a two minus c two a two plus c two. Display style e carrot two equals frac mathrum a carrot two mathrum c carrot two mathrum a carrot two plus mathrum c carrot two, where a is the equatorial radius six million three hundred and seventy eight thousand one hundred and thirty seven meters, and c is the polar radius six million three hundred and fifty six thousand seven hundred and fifty two meters. So e two equals zero point zero zero three three five eight four eight one. Applicable parameters for J2000.0 rounded to seven significant digits, excluding leading one, are which yield D psi s dt equals 2.450183 times 10 minus 12 per seconds. D psi l dt equals 5.334529 times 10 minus 12, both of which must be converted to a arc seconds annum by the number of arc seconds in 2 pi radians, 1.296 times 106. 2 pi and the number of seconds in one annum a Julian year. 3.15576 times 107s a 
D psi s d t equals fifteen point nine four eight seven eight eight a v s fifteen nine hundred and forty eight thousand eight hundred and seventy a from Williams d psi l d t equals thirty four point seven two three six three eight a v s thirty four point four five seven six nine eight a from Williams, the solar equation is a good representation of precession due the Sun because Earth's orbit is close to an ellipse, being only slightly perturbed by the other planets. The lunar equation is not as good a representation of precession due to the Moon because the Moon's orbit is greatly distorted by the Sun and neither the radius nor the eccentricity is constant over the year. Topic values equals Simon Newcomb's calculation at the end of the 19th century for general precession p in longitude gave a value of 5,025.64 arcseconds per tropical century, and was the generally accepted value until artificial satellites delivered more accurate observations and electronic computers allowed more elaborate models to be calculated. J. Henry Leister developed an updated theory in 1976, where p equals 5029.0966 arcseconds or 1.3969713 degrees per Julian century. Modern techniques such as VLBI and LLR allowed further refinements, and the International Astronomical Union adopted a new constant value in 2000, and new computation methods and polynomial expressions in 2003 and 2006. The accumulated precession is Pi equals 5,028.796195 times t plus 1.1054348 times t2 plus higher order terms in arc seconds with t the time in Julian centuries that is 36,525 days since the epoch of 2000. The rate of precession is the derivative of that. P equals 5,028.796195 plus 2.2108696 times t plus higher order terms. The constant term of this speed, 5,028.796195 arcseconds per century in above equation, corresponds to one full precession circle in 25,771.57534. Years, one full circle of 360 degrees divided with 5,028.796195 arcseconds per century. Although some other sources put the value at 25,771.4 years, leaving a small uncertainty. The precession rate is not a constant, but is, at the moment, slowly increasing over time, as indicated by the linear and higher order terms in T. In any case it must be stressed that this formula is only valid over a limited time period. It is a polynomial expression centered on the J2000 datum, empirically fitted to observational data, not on a deterministic model of the solar system. It is clear that if t gets large enough, far in the future or far in the past, the t-squared term will dominate and p will go to very large values. In reality, more elaborate calculations on the numerical model of the solar system show that the precessional constants have a period of about 41,000 years, the same as the obliquity of the ecliptic. Note that the constants mentioned here are the linear and all higher terms of the formula above, not the precession itself. That is, P equals A plus B T plus C T two plus is an approximation of 
p equals a plus b sin two pi t p, where p is the forty one thousand year period. Theoretical models may calculate the constants coefficients corresponding to the higher powers of t, but since it is impossible for a finite polynomial to match a periodic function over all numbers, the difference in all such approximations will grow without bound as t increases. However, greater accuracy can be obtained over a limited time span by fitting a high enough order polynomial to observation data, rather than a necessarily imperfect dynamic numerical model. So for present flight trajectory calculations of artificial satellites and spacecraft, the polynomial method gives better accuracy. In that respect, the International Astronomical Union chose the best developed available theory. For up to a few centuries in the past and the future, all formulas do not diverge very much. For up to a few thousand years in the past and the future, most agree to some accuracy. For eras farther out discrepancies become too large, the exact rate and period of precession may not be computed using these polynomials even for a single whole precession period. The precession of Earth's axis is a very slow effect, but at the level of accuracy at which astronomers work, it does need to be taken into account on a daily basis. Note that although the precession and the tilt of Earth's axis the obliquity of the ecliptic are calculated from the same theory and thus, are related to each other, the two movements act independently of each other, moving in opposite directions. Precession exhibits a secular decrease due to tidal dissipation from 59 to 45 inches a a. Topic. Annum Julian year during the 500 million year period centered on the present. After short term fluctuations, tens of thousands of years are averaged out. The long term trend can be approximated by the following polynomials for negative and positive time from the present in A, where t is in billions of Julian years. P minus equals fifty point four seven five eight three eight minus twenty six point three six eight five eight three T plus twenty one point eight nine zero eight six two T two P plus equals fifty point four seven five eight three eight minus twenty seven point zero 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 six five four T plus fifteen point six zero three two six five T two precession will be greater than P plus by the small amount of plus zero point one three five zero five two a between plus three omar and plus one three omar. The jump to this excess over P plus will occur in only 20 ma beginning now because the secular decrease in precession is beginning to cross a resonance in Earth's orbit caused by the other planets. According to Ward, when, in about 1,500 million years, the distance of the Moon, which is continuously increasing from tidal effects, has increased from the current 60.3 to approximately 66.5 Earth radii, resonances from planetary effects will push precession to 49,000 years at first, and then, when the Moon reaches 68 Earth radii in about 2,000 million years, to 69,000 years. This will be associated with wild swings in the obliquity of the ecliptic as well. Ward, however, used the abnormally large modern value for tidal dissipation. Using the 620 million year average provided by tidal rhythmites of about half the modern value, these resonances will not be reached until about 3,000 and 4,000 million years, respectively. However, due to the gradually increasing luminosity of the Sun, the oceans of the Earth will have vaporized before that time about 2,100 million years from now. Topic. 
See also Age of Aquarius Astrological age Astronomical nutation Axial tilt Euler angles Longitude of vernal equinox Milinkovitch cycles Sidereal year Topic Notes Topic Bibliography Berger, A. L. Obliquity and Precession for the Last Five Million Years. Astronomy and Astrophysics. 51. pp. 127–135. Bibcode, 1976ANA, .51, 127b. Capitain, N. Expressions for IAU 2000 precession quantities. Astronomy and Astrophysics. 412 to 567 minus 586. Bibcode 2003ANA.412, 567C. DOI 10.1051/0004-6368. Dreyer, J. L. E. A History of Astronomy from Thales to Kepler. 2nd ed. New York, Dover, 1953. Evans, James. The History and Practice of Ancient Astronomy. New York, Oxford University Press, 1998. Explanatory Supplement to the Astronomical Ephemeris and the American Ephemeris and Nautical Almanac Hilton, J. L. 2006. Report of the International Astronomical Union Division I Working Group on Precession and the Ecliptic PDF. Celestial Mechanics and Dynamical Astronomy. 94. pp. 351–367. Bibcode, 2006 SEMDA, 0.94, 351H. DOI, 10.1007 per seconds 10569-006-0001-2. Lieska, J. H., Ledley, T., Fricky, W. 1977. Expressions for the precession quantities based upon the IAU 1976 system of astronomical constants. Astron. Astrophys. 58. pp. 1–16. Bibcode, 1977ANA.581L. Precession and the obliquity of the ecliptic has a comparison of values predicted by different theories Panacook, A. A. History of Astronomy. New York, Dover, 1961. Parker, Richard A. Egyptian Astronomy, Astrology, and Calendrical Reckoning, Dictionary of Scientific Biography 15–706–727. Rice, Michael 1997, Egypt's Legacy, The Archetypes of Western Civilization, 3000–30 BC, London and New York. Schutz, Michael 2000. Hipparch und die Entdeckung der Procession. Bemerkungen zu David Yolanzi, die Ersbrunch des Mithraskults. Electronic Journal of Mithraic Studies. In German, archived version. Simon, J. L. 1994. Numerical expressions for precession formulae and mean elements for the Moon and the planets. Astronomy and Astrophysics. 282. pp. 663 to 683. Bibcode, 1994 ANA, 663s. Tompkins, Peter. Secrets of the Great Pyramid. With an appendix by Livio Catullo Stecchini. New York, Harper Colophon Books, 1971. Tuma, G. J. Hipparchus, Dictionary of Scientific Biography. 
volume 15 to 207 minus 224 New York Charles Scribner's Sons 1978 Tuma G J Ptolemy's Almagest London Duckworth 1984 Yolanzi David The Origins of the Mithraic Mysteries Cosmology and Salvation in the Ancient World New York, Oxford University Press, 1989. Vondrack, J., Capitaine, N., Wallace, P. 2011. New Precession Equations, Valid for Long Time Intervals. Astron. Astrophys. 534. p. A22. Bibcode, 2011 A&A, 534A, 0.22 V. DOI 10.1051/0004-6361201,111,111 minus Ward, W. R. Comments on the long-term stability of the Earth's obliquity. Icarus. 50. pp. 444-448. Bibcode, 1982 i car, .5044 w. DOI, 10.1016, 0019-1035-82-9013-4-8 External links D'Alembert and Euler's debate on the solution of the precession of the equinoxes Bowley, Roger, Merrifield, Michael. Axial precession. 60 symbols. Brady Harron for the University of Nottingham. Forced precession and nutation of Earth.